We didn't collaborate at all. Honestly, had no idea. So I, I, all I know is credit to God. That, that just fits perfect into what I feel like the Lord wants me to say. I put this on, a, on a Facebook while I was in Haiti this week. We, did, uh, we didn't have any, uh, very little electricity all week. I got one bath during the week. On Saturday morning, <laughs> the rest of the week, I, I'm like my brother. I found out you can take baby wipes, <laughs> and you can take a bath in baby, with baby wipes. My brother said he went to Haiti once, and he was in total shock, and he's kind of a clown. He came back and said, I found out you can make it a whole week with baby wipes. said, I'd wash under my arms and then put a tic-tac under each arm and <laughs> go around <laughs> rest of the day. Mick, come up here, and I want to hear a little bit about, uh, uh, about Cuba. Are you just barely moving? <laughs> yeah, I oh, I'm sorry. Right. So it wasn't. So to, uh, you hang on to that, because right. this one is on. Uh, best thing that happened? Well, it was a lot warmer than here. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm with you on that, brother. Yeah. Best thing happened probably uh, seeing the east side of the island was uh, a lot poorer than the west side. It was a, it was a total cult culture difference. Uh, it looked more like third world country on this side than it did on, on the Havana side. You're talking about on the side close to Cuba, I mean close to Haiti. Yes, it was yeah. Guantanamo, yeah. Guantanamo area where we was at. And, uh, Probably the uh, probably the encouragement we gave to the pastors and the new superintendent that it's a new district for them yeah. was probably probably the biggest blessing because they they really never believed they'd ever get a team or ever get any help on this side. Yeah. So they were really they were really in awe and really yeah. shocked that we were there on that side of the island. Biggest challenge you had in the whole uh, getting this there. This time was it was all a big challenge this time because there's they've never sent a team so it's kind of a guinea pig. <laughs> finding water was a bigger challenge this time. Was it? Finding bottled water, uh, trying to make the budget work to where we could make it back. Yeah. Enough money to get back on because uh, it was a whole different cost issue here. Uh, we didn't know what we were getting into. We went in uh, cost-wise, the hotels, the meals. We had to take a guess at that, and good thing we had a good guess because <laughs> – some things were a little more, but we got some things a little less, so it all balanced out. Yeah, good. But uh, we were followed this time, for sure. Were you? I was. They, they said I was full timed. I'm being full time now in Cuba. I've been there so much. Uh, yeah. The government's basically signing somebody to follow me around and watch me all the time. Mm. But we we kind of caught him. And we just noticed, you know, yeah. a guy shows up at your hotel the first night. Then you drive 250 miles, and he shows up at your hotel the next night. <laughs> yeah. And everywhere you go to eat, he shows up. Uh, so I'm being full-time now, so y'all be in prayer about that, because that's kind of a weird feeling being followed by the by a uh, communist government. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he can follow if he wants. I'm legal. <laughs> I'm not worried about him. Amen. I'm there doing what I'm supposed to do. Amen, brother. Bless you. Next project, where are you going from here? You know, I'm torn on that right now. I don't know. Uh, we're still going to go in Cuba again, possibly possibly October. But it looks like uh, maybe back to Comagway, maybe okay. for a dedication service for the church we've built. It's getting in the final stages now, and they're saying they may be ready to dedicate in October. That's what we're pushing for. And if we do that, we just got permits, which... Uh, glory to God on this. We got permits for the church and the other church in that town to Amen. start construction on it too. Wonderful. It finally came through. So we'll have a project to work on. Uh, maybe we'll have a church to dedicate and a project to work on there. And I don't know. We might might visit Baracoa again someday. It's it was a beautiful city. It's real neat. Wonderful. Thank you for all you do for Jesus, it's brother. A pleasure. Thank you. We thank him, don't we? God bless you. Man, that's what I, I mean, I brag about Jason Chapel and the involvement in missions. How many people in here have been on a mission trip 
out of the country. Look at that. That's awesome. You didn't raise your hand, David. Did you? Okay, you did. Uh, anyway, uh, we had, uh, we combined on our mission trip, we, we usually have a pastor's, uh, it's, it's a three-day intensive training for pastors and church leaders in December. But we had a team uh, from, most, one was from Virginia. Most of them were from a church where I preach in uh, Ohio, a, a Nazarene church, my, my friend. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, well, he preached here for me as a guest back a year or two ago. But uh, they took a team. I have been praying uh, for God to uh, raise up someone who can take over when God's finished with me in Haiti because I'm 75. And you want God to pick that person. You don't want to pick that person. He just has a way of doing that. And uh, so we had three of us ministers and then a work team that did construction like they do. Uh, and then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we, uh, we taught. We, the first, uh, on Wednesday, we had 130 people, uh, pastors and church leaders, and then uh, that many or more on Thursday and on Friday, too. And, uh, and the Lord helped us. It, it, was, it was a real blessing. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have electricity uh, m most of the time we were there, and that was kind of, there are always unexpected challenges. I don't care where you go. But the Lord was with us, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for your prayers. We, we feel your prayers. I was glad to get home last night and get a couple of hours on a real bed instead of a board. <laughs> Mary and I sleep on what I call the board. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, Anyway, it's better. It was better than a lot of Haitians have, and we have a medical, uh, two medical trips going, uh, one in January, which is a great time to get out of, of Tennessee, and then uh, and these will be in two different places, uh, and then another one the week after that. So we need your prayers. This this will be for medical people, and they need a, a support staff to help them as they go. But uh, that's what it's all about. So you heard their song. Thank you guys for listening to the Lord, for the Holy Spirit, and picking your music. It, it, again and again, it just brings affirmation. So back to what I said from Haiti. Uh, we, we had uh, inverter where we were, so we, and, and we actually had Wi-Fi when we had power. So when we had enough power to charge the batteries, <laughs> uh, we could communicate. And so one night, I, p I put a few pictures on, if you watch. Uh, uh, Mick, I don't know if you, we hadn't talked about this, but I, I just wanted to say that we, this family, I, I really got stuff to preach, but I, <laughs> we haven't talked about this, but I thought this is an interesting thought that I had. I don't know if you agree with it. You don't have to shake your head, but tell me afterwards I'm right or wrong. Uh, uh, Haiti is a capitalist country, crony capitalism, yes. A lot of stealing and vice in, in Haiti. Uh, Cuba used to be very prosperous and was a capitalist country. They turn to communism and they're still driving 1954 cars. Have I got that right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know how much trouble they have making phone calls. Uh, Cuba, I mean, Haiti, third poorest country in the world, poorest country in this hemisphere. Now, as bad as Haiti is, in some ways, it's passed up Cuba because everybody has a cell phone in Haiti, you can call from the mountains. You can, you can call. And uh, our Haitian leader was talking about the impact of Christianity. In the, Mary and I have been going there, making trips for 28 years. 
when we first went there, we dealt with voodoo all the time. It'd keep you awake at night, voodoo drums. Uh, our leader told about one night when he said, enough is enough. And he said he heard the drums keeping him awake on the mountain near our place. And he said, I take authority over you in Jesus' name. I anyway, I, I can't repeat all of his prayer. But he said that, that voodoo priest got saved. And we haven't heard drums now in the last six or seven years. We haven't. And, and don't see voodoo flags like you once did in our part of the area because of the impact of Christianity, of the church. And, and everybody's got a cell phone. You can be poor in Haiti and have a cell phone. Uh, you don't have to pay if somebody calls you. You have to pay only if you make a call. So you have a lot of poor people wishing somebody would call them. <laughs> but it, it was wonderful. And I, I was just, something about it, Mick, while y'all were over there and we were across the little shore, I was just thinking, I was just grateful for you. And I didn't wave at you. Didn't you? Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, we, I was just so grateful that somebody from, Jason Chapel was over there, and I thought, this, who else could claim that in the church like us out here by Garner Creek? Uh, so I hadn't told you yet. <laughs> so this is what I put on. We're most like Jesus when we're serving, not when we're trying to walk on water. Now, I said that. This, did you hear their song? <laughs> We are, would you just say that with me? We are most like Jesus when we are serving, not when we're trying to walk on water. And I think that some of the stuff we hear on TV and all is people trying to get you to walk on water. Just serve him. It's a wonderful thing to serve him. Well, I felt uh, led to scripture that I don't think I've ever used here. I've thought about this scripture in the past, and it's a, it's a challenge uh, to me in trying to really understand the full impact of what it means from, uh, from John, the 18th chapter. And I'll try to watch the time and get home and see about Miss Mary. But in the 18th chapter of John, uh, when they came to arrest Jesus, and uh, the, the disciples are in confusion. They don't know. In, in uh, verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. I figure the way that happened that he ducked. <laughs> and it, <laughs> he cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malachus. It's interesting that John would know this person. And here's the next verse. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? What does he mean by the cup? It's a personal thing. I mean, to reduce this to just a real simple thought is, shall I not obey what the Father has asked me to do? That's what your cup is. Everybody has a different cup, you know. You remember Jesus said before when he was praying in the garden, because not all cups are easy. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I was thinking today about the ministry that God has given me and what I want. I, I'm, I would be very greatly disappointed if people who sit under the teaching and the preaching that God puts on my heart, if you're not confronted, 
I, I, I'm not, I don't claim to be like some of the TV people. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not, I hope sometimes you do feel good. But I'm here to try to bring before myself and all of us the real issues of the Christian faith so we're confronted. And some people are going to run from that. The Bible says in the last days people will want people who, with, who, who would tell them what they want to hear, make them feel good. I like feeling good too. But the, the, Jesus, when he prayed, said, you know, if it's possible, I, I don't like the way this is going. This is not easy. So if it's possible, nevertheless, not my will. And now it progresses on to this moment when he's being arrested and, uh, and he brings up the idea of the cup again and says to Peter, you know, Peter had one idea. He's dealing with life with a sword. And we all have a tendency to deal with life with a sword, which is in the flesh. He's doing the best he knows. He, if you talk to him, he'd have said, it's because I love you, Jesus. Because I care about you. So he's dealing with life with a sword. Jesus is on another plane. He's dealing with life in the context of his purpose and what he's here for. An obedience. And that's why he said, my, my cup, my cup, my cup, he get, was, his cup was to do the will of the Father. You and I are involved in his cup. It wasn't for him because he was willing to go to the cross and die and, and, and his cup involved you and me. That's what it was all about. It was, a, it was, an, it was not about selfishness but selflessness because he, he didn't need to be redeemed. He, but we do. And as I was thinking about how we all have a cup, I, uh, this is Titus's cup. It's got a teddy bear on it. He's at it's Trapaganza or whatever this weekend. I thought teddy bear was good for Titus. This is Titus' cup. It, this literally is his cup. What is that cup about, you know? It's doing the will of God. I could have had a cup of mix today, and his cup would be different. But his cup is to do what God asked him to do. Go to Cuba. Go on mission trips. Your cup may just be across the street. Everybody has a cup to drink. Your, your cup and my cup, they're not always the same, you know. I went, I, uh, this is Crystal's cup. Hope, it says on it. It's cracked, too. <laughs> We're all cracked pots. This, this, this came out of her office. What is her cup? Her cup, the basic principle is the same for all of us. Your cup is whatever God asks you to do to fulfill his plan and purpose for your life. I mean, this is what I hope God will help us see. Your cup is not, well, I'm going to church every Sunday. No, no, it's more profound than that. We come here to celebrate because we've been drinking his cup, our cup. You know what I'm saying? We've been. If you start to live out your cup, whatever God asks you to do, you will have something to celebrate on Sunday. But Sunday can never take the place, never take the place of you doing what. Uh, I, is this plain? Do you, do you understand what we're saying? Jesus said, "Wait, Peter." Shall I not drink the cup the Father asked me to drink? In other words, 
You can't plot the course of my life, Peter. You can't tell me what to do. You're not in control of my life. Only the Father is. And whatever he asked me to do. And what he could have said, it was no time to give a sermon. But what he could have said, Peter, if I don't drink my cup, you're going to go to hell. You'll be lost. Because the cup that I drink has to do with your salvation. It's dying on the cross for humanity. And there, there is a profound truth here that we should all think about. That in a real way, Mick, when each one of us, when we drink from our cup, do what God asks us to do, our lives become light and redemptive, just like Jesus did. We can't save people. He's always the Savior. You, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying we become the Savior. But as we obey him, each one of us, our lives, our spiritual influence affects other people, and it draws them, it draws them to him. We, we, we all have a cup. Every one of us is a Christian. We have a cup. And I stole this from Vicky's desk. This is Vicky's cup. It's different from your cup or my cup. It's her, her way of serving. Ser she's, she not only serves you, but she serves me as a pastor in an incredible way. To, you know, I'm 75. I forget. She has to remind me over and over, you know, you need to do this. Uh, it's so neat, y'all. Don't, don't think because we don't set up here in these two rooms. We communicate all the time. That's, uh, that's the day we have today. We're never out of communication with, with the electronics that we have today. It's a different... This different time. But this is her cup uh, with the gift of administration. She doesn't have a choice not to do that. If that's what God asked her to do, you could either say, I'll drink from the cup God gives me, or I reject it. And you, we, it so the, the, I, I think if you get this, you will understand I'm not literally talking... And neither was Jesus literally talking about a cup. This is my cup. I carry this thing all over Haiti. I think when David was in Haiti with me, and we were, he's trying to be gracious to the old man. And we were walking up the dirt road, walking out. They all want to carry my backpack for me. And I appreciate that kindness, like I'm too old. And I say, no, they don't understand. I have to carry it myself. And you have to carry yours. You have to do whatever God asks you to do. Nobody can drink your cup but you. Peter, put your sword away. Quit striving in your own flimsy way. All you do is cut off an ear. We need to save souls. We need to reach the lost. You can't reach them with a sword. You reach them when each one of us does what God asks us to do. I think, I think it, uh, about Buford sitting here that he didn't even know we existed a couple of years ago. And he comes, and, and I could say this about many of you, but, but he finds a cup of serving. He just plugs in here. We didn't even know about these mics like this. And 
he just plugs in and starts helping us with the sound. It was better than it's ever been. He's just drinking his cup. What a church, any church would be, become if everybody just took their cup serious and did what God asked you to do. That's where the blessing is. And sometimes it's a bitter cup. It's not... Mick knows this. All of you know this. Doing God's work is not always easy. I can tell you that. I, I, I haven't slept more than four hours a night any all this last week, and I slept on a board. What I did sleep and and uh, wished I could have a hot shower and ate some food I didn't particularly care for and. Got up earlier than I wanted to get up because the Haitians get up before daylight and they, they're they noisy. They want you up too. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not anybody. Anybody that offers you a Christianity, in a, in a cup of life that has no suffering in it, is lying to you. But there's nothing greater in the world, brothers and sisters, than saying to Jesus, whatever you ask me to do, whatever you want me to be, that's what I'll be. And putting your sword away, quit fighting, surrender to his plan. And... Live with that cup that he gives you. Uh, I think about this moment in, uh, which is, if you think about this moment, th this moment in between Peter and Jesus is where all of us are, you know, off and on. Th those moments when the, there is the tension between being what God asks us to be, doing what God asks us to do, and wanting to run from it and resist it and deal with life with the sword. We all do it, don't we? You, you, don't, just, you don't just have one of those moments. It's the constant decision that we all have to make where we, we look at, we look at those who would try to tell us that's not the way to live or fight. We look at those and we say to them, you know, my life's not about a sword. My life is about fulfilling God's purpose. It's about drinking the cup he's given me to drink, living the life he's called me to live, being the person he's called me to be. That's what your cup is. I can't tell you what your cup is. You can't tell me what mine is. For some of you, it becomes obvious. There might be a few of you who don't even have a cup. You're just living your life the way you want to live it, the way, doing what you want to do. And you can't be happy that way. When, when we surrender our lives and yield to living them for him, there is a divine connection that takes place. There is new life. Is that right, Buford? There is new life. There is something that happens to us. That's why, I, it, no matter if I have to go two weeks with a... Do you know I went to Haiti uh, a couple years ago and my luggage never came. I wore the same underwear all week. That was bad. They got me through customs really quick. <laughs> <laughs> So whatever, whatever God asks you to do, what, what plans he has for you, 
If you, if you will submit to that and stop resisting in your marriage, your relationships, your finances, every aspect of your life, say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Whatever you've given me, that's, that's what I'll do. You will enter into a new level of spirituality, of God's grace and mercy that you will sense in your life as, as he changes you. We're transformed into his image when like he did. Remember, he's human, and this is his example to us. But we all have our garden moments, don't we? I think I've told you this. I've had, there have been a few times back there when voodoo kind of waylaid me after a couple trips to Haiti. And I, I tried to worm out of going ever again. In fact, I said to Mary, and I meant every word of it, I would give somebody $5,000 to go in my place. That's how intimidated I was. I didn't want to go. But I can't pass my cup off to Paul. He has his own. That's the body. That's the body. Your life matters. It influences for good or bad. Don't run from your calling. Don't run from what God asks you to be and do because that's where your joy and fulfillment is to be found. So I have to give this back to Crystal because I can't drink from her cup. And Vicky will have to take hers back and the big teddy bear, his. This is mine. How about you? Let's bow our heads. There's a lot of times, Lord, I don't even know how to pray or what to say. But something tells me in my heart there are some people here who've been kind of running from their cup. They've been living life with the sword more than the cup. Would you let them know today how much they're missing out, how much you love them, and don't let them be afraid to say, Lord, Whatever you cup you give me, that's what I'll live by your grace and mercy. As we sit here just with our heads bowed, I will not beg anybody. That's beneath the gospel. As we sit here just with our heads bowed, as a family this morning of God's people, and, and maybe you are in a Gethsemane moment like Jesus was. Maybe you're in that moment in your life. And you just need a little extra prayer. And you want to say, like he did, nevertheless, not my will. You want to say, I, shall I not drink the cup the Father's given me? I'm going to ask you to do something, and the Lord will be watching. This is not for people to see. Our heads are bowed. But Jesus is watching. I know he is this morning. And you just like to take a step. You get up and come and, and kneel and let's pray together. I'm joining you. We all have those moments. And you just get up because you know Jesus is watching and you want him to know you don't want to live life by the sword, but you want to live life in obedience to the cup he's given you. You just get up and come right now with our heads bowed.
It's between you and God. Just come.